The process begins here, and it is a long and costly process. It begins with the apprehension of a man or a woman who has performed a criminal action against society. Payment swiftly follows for both the offender and society. The offender pays by losing his freedom, his contact with friends and family. Society pays with money spent to try, convict, incarcerate, and correct the offender so as to prevent him from repeating the criminal action. No one can say exactly what the cost to society is, but all agree the price tag is a high one. The cost to society has to include the 5000 roughly $5,000 corrections claims it costs to keep a man in prison for a year. You have to add police costs, FBI costs, court costs, welfare costs, parole and probation costs. Senator Mathias says it costs $50,000 a year to keep one man in prison for a year. I think the figure is close to $68,000 per inmate for one year. However many dollars society spends, what does it expect in return? Rehabilitation, the changing of non-productive offenders into useful citizens, is the official answer. And examples of the rehabilitative process are not hard to find. Even a casual trip through Maryland's correctional system will turn up many scenes such as these. Men and women involved in work and recreational activities which are approved by society. It is all part of the system's expressed desire to rehabilitate. But does this process really work? Can it possibly succeed when people are still treated as numbers? When you get so that you can deal with the person as a person, as a human being, then you can help him. This I know. You can help him. But when you put people in masses of three, four hundred, a thousand, fifteen hundred, two thousand people, you can't do nothing but warehousing. That fuck y'all niggas talking about. That my flow, right? Every time I did this shit, niggas got hyped, yo. To purge the next nigga, respect for those before me. In these last days, I'm bringing rap glory. In the streets, they hear it. Some will remember the lyrics. In my demise, some will remember me in spirit. And I ain't trying to die like Pac and Big and lose my talent to a coach and thug life. I'm a man. See a man stay around and take his fam. Like fuck y'all plans. See, we feel like stars. Shine like stars. Fuck stars. Fuck y'all. We examples. Samples of the hood, thugs from the hood Young bloods in the hood like they love the hood They love the young bitches Nickel bags and guns in the benches We see it all off the benches I learned how to sew seeing niggas stitches In the pain, don't even ask me about the pain They kill me, I won't maintain By the bus stop, two blocks from the dust spot Somebody bust the shot, they said Sam got God damn Sam, he wildin' in the back cat rat that eat swine, fuck his arms and hold nines That's far rock for you, my block for you Y'all bitch niggas only live in jail cause I know you When I come home, watch how shots blow you Through the upholstery, even through your mom's groceries Little Sam died three months later He got set up in his elevator His cape was regulated, his name faded He had a son by this bitch he dated Shorty waited for two decades, kid To get them niggas kids if he couldn't get them Then one day, out of the blue Bam, he heard shit like last names and cars driven Them larger than life niggas was about to leave here Out. We 70 deep and starving Son couldn't walk through my yard past curfew I rose from an era of terror where it was legal The tote gun get red and bust a nigga head And if pussy hold for dead, then pussy hold for dead What the fuck is assault? Never heard of this till niggas started snitching I'm still stitching motherfuckers up I deal with high science and supreme refinements To any wicked Germans destroyed and burned We the guards without question Do what I manifest in all so ways and actions Open that lick your cannon I'm ill when I shoot the pill like Ed O'Bannon In my head lies a thought punk cock Off safety 
shots fired, follow blood trail to the stairwell Face down, he lay sound, round to his crown Shorty hip pockets, midtown Big Clyde holding him down, with the dead on Siren sounds, bullets chip brick, presets Followed by the amulet, respond to the bomb threat I picked up this MC trade from the masters I'm sharpening my carpentry blade for sculpting Carving into mountains, the faces of my eight classmates That stomp through the streets and states with protected neck tape Wu-Tang t-shirts and bandanas, snatch mics and snuff niggas and jack the rappers Just a few decades ago, during the era of striped uniforms and lockstep marching, the chain gang was the symbol of prison rehabilitation. The object was to wear a man out, to so physically exhaust him that he had little time to question the system or create trouble. That there was little opportunity to learn a viable trade was a logical result of this early 20th century practice. And after many years, it was abolished, or at least made more sophisticated. Charles, how long have you been in the penitentiary population now? Oh, about three months now. And how are you getting along? Well, I, you know, consider. Do you have, can, well, do you have any particular problems you want to tell me about? Well, no, uh, today, you know, I got straightened out. Uh, I'm going to work. Today, the symbol of prison rehabilitation is the Correctional Systems Classification Officer, or Counselor. He's a combination father image and social worker who's supposed to know the inmate, be aware of his problems, and treat him as an individual who can be guided rather than forced in the direction of socially acceptable behavior. One gets the impression this concept of counseling inmates is a valid one, as most offenders feel rejected by society, come from broken homes or ghetto areas, and don't really believe anyone cares about them except when they break the law. Thus, having someone who will listen, communicate, and care even an officially appointed someone, is a step in the right direction. Unfortunately, the system breaks down right from the start. Early in his prison experience, the typical inmate will meet his classification counselor as a matter of official procedure. But after that, he'll probably run into difficulties. And the problem is one of economics. There simply aren't enough counselors to fill the needs of the correctional system. Yet there seem to be adequate numbers of correctional officers or guards in the institutions. At the Maryland Penitentiary, for example, there are about 750 inmates in the non-diagnostic population, 250 correctional officers or guards, and six classification officers. Each counselor's caseload, therefore, is about 125 men. At the Maryland House of Correction, there are 1,500 inmates guarded by nearly 300 men and counseled by 16. This is a caseload of nearly 100. At the combined Maryland Correctional Institution and Training Center at Hagerstown, there are nearly 1,600 inmates, 350 guards, but only a dozen classification officers. Each counselor's caseload is about 130 men. Because these caseloads are two to three times higher than they ought to be if the counselor and inmate are to establish any feeling of genuine rapport, the concept of guidance rather than coercion, of treating the inmate as something more than a number, breaks down from the very beginning. The inmate seldom sees his counselor except in an emergency, a situation that often forces him to rebel even more against the institution and all that it represents, both good and bad. In fact, many men leave the system angrier at the counseling they did not receive than the harsh treatment they did. Stay out of difficulty. Well, I stayed out of difficulty by just uh, going about my own business. I say doing your own time, so to speak. Right. Well, in my opinion, the counseling the institution it's not worth two dead flies, basically, basically because of the fact that the, the counselor, you can hardly catch up with him. You know, I was in the institution myself for 13 months, and I saw him once, once or twice, no, no more than that. You know, you see him, he says he's on your case, you want him to do a favor for you, he says, okay, come down to my office, you go down there, he's not there, you can't find him. We brought these issues up while we was in the institution to the warden, and he said he was going to get on the case, and it seemed like to me they're not, they're not obedient. You can't find him. You can't find him. I tried to uh, get one 
to call my home. Someone was sick. I got word through a visit that someone was sick. And um, I looked for him for two weeks. For two damn weeks, man. You know, this creates a lot of uh, animosity from an inmate to uh, institution-wise, you know. He, he rebels against this, you know. He feels though that he don't have his mother, his father, that no one to, to, to love him. And this man's assigned to him the minute he enters the institution. Once he get in there, this is the only one that he can confide in him and one of the, uh, the preachers or the priests. They are the only ones you can catch, but the priests the, or the preachers, they're only on a religious level. They can't uh, uh, help, help get things coordinated for this man to re-enter back into the community. You know, this man that you were assigned to, if you can't catch him, then I think they should get rid of him. Him and the whole bunch of crooks that work in the institution. Because of inadequate counseling, the ever-present need to keep prisoners quiet, and a lingering feeling on the part of society that inmates are wards of the state who may be used to fill the state's needs, most of Maryland's prison population puts in time on a variety of jobs created for them by state use industries. This is hardly chain gang labor, but in many ways it fulfills the same function, that of pacification. Most inmates work in the state use shops, not so much because they will learn a useful skill, but because the 55 cents plus a day wage keeps them in money for cigarettes or other necessities. Thus, on any given day of the week, most of the population seems to be busy, largely because of state use industries. At the Maryland Correctional Institution for Men at Hagerstown, one of the chief industries is a cannery. The facility is something of a holdover from the days when the institution operated an extensive farm on which ghetto dwellers were taught to milk cows. Now that aspect of correction is past, but the cannery remains, employing 70 to 75 inmates and turning out more than a quarter of a million cans of vegetables each year. The top daily wage paid the assembly line workers is $1.05 for a lead man. Unfortunately, most cannery work outside prison walls is performed by women. So the work is of dubious value to the inmate who genuinely wants to learn the trade. The bulk of Maryland state use shops are located within the confines of the Maryland House of Correction at Jessup. In fact, this broad area might be called state use plaza as it is bounded by nearly a dozen small factories turning out state-use products. According to officials, learning good work habits is the chief byproduct of the system for the inmate. Nevertheless, even Francis J. Bach, state-use industries manager, admits that it is difficult for the average inmate to translate what he does in state-use shops into a useful occupation on the outside. Well, this, this is a wood shop. We manufacture everything for the state industries and also nonprofit organizations. On an average, we have 100 to 105 men working here. Uh, they make from 50 cents to $1.10 a day, which is graduated into five, very, five scales. In this shop, we have approximately 40 different types of machines. And this ranges from a, a rip saw, cutoff saw, planer, and the band sanders, finishing machines, is belt sanders, assembly and finishing. In any one of these lines, a man would be qualified to go out into the similar industry and automatically go to work at the same job when he leaves here. Uh, the biggest problem that we have is the length of time the man is in the shop due to the fact that uh, they can from here go into camp and are on many occasions not here long enough to complete the training. State Use Industries also features the spectacle of several dozen men, most of whom are black, working at sewing machines and buttonholers, busily learning skills traditionally reserved for women on the outside. In this particular area, there are no knit industries in this area that he could go out and put to work, this type of thing. However, this is a highly mechanical type of business, and it requires a real mechanical skill in the manufacturing of the material themselves. Uh, unfortunately, there, as I said, the industry is in the south, but I believe good work habits can be established here and a good understanding of machinery is what you obtain in this shop. We also have a sewing shop here at the institution which employs approximately 165 inmates and four supervisors. In this shop we manufacture approximately 10 different garments. The main garments we are manufacturing are pants and shirts. On an average 
here the quota for pants are 300 a day and shirts 400. Uh, the other garments can be coveralls, uh, aprons, curtains, uh, blue denim jackets, and so forth. These garments are manufactured for the state institutions such as mental hygiene, health department, juvenile services, and correctional institutions. In, in this shop, uh, the men are trained uh, to operate single and double needle machines and many other specialized such as uh, button holders, button sewers. On the outside, it, this is normally a woman's trade. Another state-use industry at the Jessup House of Correction is the automobile tag shop, which because of the new five-year plates, of course, has fallen on difficult times. Now the tag shop makes replacement units, about 300,000 a year, as well as signs for various organizations of the state. Previously, the tag shop was one of the busiest industries in the area, although it taught a trade that did not exist on the outside. And finally, there's the inevitable prison laundry, of which there are several in the state, all teaching skills usually reserved for women. This is the institution laundry, which at, here at the House of Correction, that employs approximately 185 inmates. We have 13 contracts with both mental hygiene, uh, juvenile services, University Hospital, which is the largest contract we have, and do approximately five million pounds of laundry a year. Actually, the trade in this uh, this field is not too much. Uh, it is not used too much outside because actually it is mostly labor, and in some in majority of the areas, such as press work, it is a female's job. However, in the washroom, which is basically the only area that offers employment to the inmate, uh, most of the men can go out and command a respectable salary since a lot of laundries in town do hire these men. The majority of the men in the institution or in this area are illiterate and actually work in the laundry because they prefer to work here since they're not too dexterous to go into other shops. Dexterity is not too good for handling machinery and so forth, and this does not require too much knowledge on their hands. Other people like this type of work and would rather do it, and it does offer benefits to them from within the institution, such as getting their laundry done, helping other to get other laundry done. Uh, this is uh, perhaps a fringe benefit. Uh, when a man goes into um, uh, a work program into the prison, the people in there want to work as little as possible. So they try to get a man with as long a stretch as possible and put him in a particular job. Well, if he's going to learn anything, he has to progress from one job to another job to another job until finally he learns a skill. But this doesn't happen. A man is put in one particular job and he stays there as long as, as he's in prison. Earl Maltzby, for instance, tells a story about how he learned to make chair seats. Now, he never even saw how the rest of the chair was made, just made those chair seats. If a guy's making license plates, he's on one particular function. I knew a man who went into the paint shop because he used to read the papers and he saw almost every day ads for guys with skills at making paint. He worked in that shop for three years and then quit because he recognized by that time that he would never have a viable skill that would enable him to get a job when he got out, even though it was possible for him to learn it, because he was kept upon that one function for three years. Approximately 60 to 70 percent of Maryland's prison population is functionally illiterate. Yet funds for educational needs seem to be hardest to come by. According to the budget of the Maryland Division of Correction, the amount of money spent on custodial care is five to ten times the amount spent for educational, vocational, recreational, and religious programs combined. As an example, about six percent of the total budget for the Maryland Penitentiary goes toward educating, training, or otherwise upgrading the inmates' skills. In sharp contrast, sixty percent of the budget is spent just to make certain the inmate stays behind bars. 
Conditions at the other institutions are not markedly different. At Hagerstown's Correctional Institution, half the teaching staff works on a temporary basis and could be dropped at any time. Because of economics, the educational system cuts corners, and most inmates are smart enough to realize it. Larry, what is your opinion of the value or effectiveness of the school program here? Uh, at the present time, I'm a member of the school program. I'm uh, taking my uh, high school equipment here. And it's a self-help uh, basis. I mean, as far as uh, direct contact with your teachers, it's very little, you know. And, uh, and I feel as though if the individual, he would have to strive harder to uh, uh, actually uh, accomplish anything in this institution. It is more difficult then for an inmate to acquire an education uh, under the present setup as it would be under another setup right definitely what, what kind of educational setup would you prefer well i would prefer educational setup whereas we have a screening where we have uh, uh like the grade groups set in these particular grades and professional teachers come in here and teach these people as individuals sit down and help them with their problems if they don't know how to add or spell or things of this nature but instead what's happening now they're giving them a packet to read from this packet and they work at their own pace, at their own speed. And this is not really uh, adding to the aggressiveness of these people. On the basis of how that program is now constituted, uh, should it be continued or discontinued? Well, it should be remodeled. It should be, the whole thing should be gone over it with the fine tooth comb. It should be continued because it's beneficial to its degree. See, behind the fact that if I was to say it would be to discontinue it, then you will have a lot of cats that uh, will be just going back into the same old thing. This is a form of pacification, the present school thing. Larry, out of the total prison population here, how many of these fellows are interested in enrolling in an educational program? Well, I believe that it's up to the institution to stimulate these guys' interest behind the fact that uh, we, are, we have been convicted of crimes and evidently we have dropped out of school for some reason or another. So we should uh, institute programs in the school that would stimulate the interests of the inmates here. And I'm sure that if the right uh, guidance is given to these inmates that they will be accepted by the majority. The system is trying to change, however, and recent years have seen the opening of several new doors to the successful education and vocational training of Maryland's prison population. This double wire fence, for instance, stands at the entrance to the Maryland Correctional Training Center for males at Hagerstown. The facility is a comparatively new one and as such is forward looking. Everything about the Maryland Correctional Training Center, in fact, with the exception of its almost symbolic wire fence, seems exactly the opposite of the traditional Gothic prison. The facility is spread over a large area, its architectural style is more interesting than that of conventional prisons, and there are broad areas of grass and concrete walkways, much in the manner of a college campus. Nevertheless, the men assigned to the MCTC, and there are nearly 1,000 of them, have a rigid schedule and must follow it. They do so because only the most trustworthy and promising inmates are allowed to serve out their sentences at the training center. The courses here are more relevant than those available at other institutions in the state. The atmosphere is certainly more conducive to learning, and in many cases the quality of instruction is more professional. The programs at the training center include automobile mechanics, baking, barbering, cooking, electronics, machine shop training, masonry, meat cutting, plumbing, shipyard skills such as welding and woodworking. Some of these skills, such as those taught in the shipbuilding shops, are carried out with the cooperation of local unions. On April 26, 1971, for example, the shipbuilding skills course was first offered through the efforts of the Metropolitan Council AFL-CIO Institutional Training Project and model cities. One of the most comprehensive courses at the institution, that of masonry, runs 20 weeks and includes more than 500 hours of both theory and practical training. This includes the opportunity to construct and design a series of projects using brick, block, and stone. The inmate is also taught the safety rules which must be followed in this line of work. 
Other courses, nearly as comprehensive, underline the credo of the training center that the incarcerated resident must be prepared to face a complicated, industrialized, mechanized work world. And only through a combination of both academic and vocational training will he be able to meet the challenge and demands of modern society. To help him accomplish this, the Training Center Educational Program is officially approved and recognized by the Maryland Board of Education. All Training Center supervisory and teaching staff members, both academic and vocational, are qualified and certified under the same laws applicable to those teaching in the public school system. Most of the Training Center courses, which range from 10 to 20 weeks, are carried out with the latest equipment. A similarly ambitious project was started at the Correctional Institution for Women in January 1970. The course was a modern one in typing and key punch operation, but it failed. It failed for two reasons, both of which are extremely relevant to the problem of inmate rehabilitation in general. First, the program failed because no provision was made to employ the trainees once they had left the institution. Second, those in command assumed that all women wanted to be typists or secretaries. This attempt to impersonally force the prison population into stereotyped positions has led more than one official to conclude that all the programs in the world, without genuine concern, may not be enough. In, in, in the area of programs, uh, we find that you can create an, an individual program or two programs or three programs, uh, possibly a maximum of five programs. Uh, but you find yourself in a situation where you're taking uh, multiple individuals into an institution and programming them and molding them into those given programs. Now, if programs are going to exist, those programs must be supported by identif identified areas of employment on the outside. They have to be established. There are difficulties in establishing that in reference to women, women, uh, female offenders, as to what employment avenues are available to them. Now, I believe that there are additional things that must be done within an institution above and beyond just a program to force a person in. I think that we, uh, uh, above and beyond that program, which may lead to a job, there are factors that have to be dealt with in reference to individual problems, personality needs, psychological needs, sociological needs. These can come in through other avenues that can supplement a program. But the program in and of itself is not going to be the answer. Mr. Keller, isn't it not a fact that many of your problems can be traced to the conviction on the part of the general public that prisons are designed to punish as opposed to rehabilitate? Yes. And uh, I think that if the Division of Corrections and the entire social justice system has one goal, it would be made to make the public aware that primarily most of these people, and I say most of them, and you can apply any percentile that you want to, but most of these people are receptive to change, and if, if we hit the right note on these guys' scale, uh, that they automatically be receptive to programs and can go back into the community uh, with something productive to offer. Perhaps if there is a consensus to emerge from the discussions dealing with the effects of confinement on inmates, as well as the value of prison rehabilitation, it is this. Most people can be changed for the better if we are willing to dedicate time, money, and genuine effort to them. This means finding out from the inmate, ex-offender, and those who work closely with them, which programs work, what programs are needed, and supplementing these programs with meaningful personal counseling so that a man will not feel like just one of the herd. One method of filling the need for counseling services might be for the state of Maryland to hire ex-offenders as institutional counselors. This would certainly help close the communications gap. At the same time, it would do much towards solving another severe problem, which we shall examine in part four of this series. The difficulty of finding useful employment for the man or woman who's released from prison with few skills and a record. Unfortunately, the hiring of sufficient numbers of ex-offenders to do the job would certainly 
generate a great deal of controversy and cost money. Society seems willing to spend money to house offenders, but as we have seen, funds for really enlightened rehabilitation services are hard to come by. That the alternatives, crime and human degradation, ultimately cost more seems beside the point to many people. Thus, the rate of recidivism continues at an appallingly high rate, with prison changing few persons for the better. On part three of Bars to Progress, however, we shall examine some hopeful signs of maturity within the prison population, signs that manifest themselves in the organizations known as self-help groups. We invite you to be with us tomorrow at the same time. This is George Rogers reporting for WMAR-TV.